course, I'm Professor Cass Castleberry, and in this section we're going to be talking about the morality of capital punishment. And just as a warning, just like I've all said in a lot of my other videos, remember this is just um, this is for my ethics class, and it's just going to give a quick review of the main points in our discussion. It's not meant as an exhaustive study on this at all. Um, I just want to make sure that they're prepared for everything that's going to be on the exam and what they need to know, and hopefully it'll help you guys out too. So in this discussion, one of the things that um, I want to bring up is a distinction between restorative punishment and retributive punishment. Um, restorative, both types of punishment we try to do here in the United States. Restorative is, is a type of punishment where we want to restore the criminal um, and so they can come back into society. You know, maybe we, they spend some time in jail or there's probation, something like this, but the goal is is to um, get them back to being a normal citizen so they can come back. Um, we do a lot of punishments like that. Um, whether it works like that, that's for another time. Okay. Um, then there's retributive justice or punishment. Um, and this type of punishment is aimed at getting a vengeance or revenge on the person. It's not necessarily about making them a better person, it's about getting them back. Um, and obviously, as we'll see, what we're discussing uh, in this section, the death penalty and life imprisonment are both versions of retributive punishment. Obviously, if you're in prison for life, we, you are deemed as someone who can never return to society. And obviously, if you get the death penalty, well, there is no restoring you after you're dead. All right. Um, and so that leads us now to the question of um, a what we're going to talk about is, this, is retributive punishment and the question of whether the death penalty is justified. When we have the ability to give people life imprisonment, um, should we be doing this? Um, is there ever a crime that's so heinous that is deserving of death? Um, that's what we're going to look at. Now, I just want to mention, I'm, in our class, I'm not to so uh, totally focused on it. I'm more focused on the moral and philosophical arguments. But it's just, it does um, uh, need mentioning the empirical arguments, arguments that are based upon the experience and um, the observations we make about the death penalty. For one example, someone will say, well, whether it's just or not, maybe it's a deterrent. It prevents people from uh, doing heinous acts. That's debatable, um, though there are many who may claim that. Also, people will look at the cost. You know, someone will say, well, a bullet costs, you know, 38 cents, something like that. Well, um, most studies have shown that actually it costs more to kill someone than it does to keep them in prison for life. Um, that has a lot to do with the courts and the appellate system, um, but we want a good appeal system if we're going to be killing people because we don't want to kill innocent people. Um, so it ends up costing more to, to have a death penalty. Um, the way maybe race plays a role in this. Um, we see that minorities tend to get the death penalty way more um, uh, than others. So, um, you know, is something like death penalty something inherently racist? Others may say, well, it's not really death penalty, it's a system. A lot of these may uh, refer to that, but that's something that you may be interested in. And also, um, what about this idea that innocent lives could be lost? Um, there are, have been many studies that have shown that per perhaps up to 26 people have been killed since uh, the death penalty in the 70s was reinstated, um, that we found out later from DNA evidence. Now, it doesn't mean they're necessarily innocent, but that if that all the evidence was there, they would not have received the death penalty. Um, whether innocent or not, that's another thing. Um, the Innocence Project um, is something that looks into these death penalty cases. Um, and also life imprisonment cases as well. So those are just some interesting places you may want to look at, but that is not necessarily the focus of our uh, lecture this, uh, in this section. What we want to concentrate on are the moral arguments. Given that, let's say, you know, uh, for people who are pro-death penalty, um, assume that no innocent lives are lost, okay? Assume it's not racist, um, and the cost doesn't matter, right? Um, assuming this, you know, is a death penalty something that criminals ought to have happen to them if they do a worse enough crime, that it's the morally correct thing or just thing to do, versus given, let's say, everything's perfect and, you know, people who are in life in prison will not kill more, um, they will not end up murdering other prisoners, things like that if we can get rid of that, or given that, is life imprisonment the better way to go and the death penalty is never justified? Are these things that we should perhaps consider? Um, that's what these thinkers we are here are going to think about is the moral argument. Given everything was perfect, are these two punishments just or not? Okay. First one we discuss is Walter Burns and his essay, um, and he is someone who is for the death penalty. He's a death penalty proponent, and he believes that there are certain crimes that are so heinous it's deserving of death. Um, he believes it holds the criminal responsible for their action. I know it sounds kind of strange, but he says if we don't give the criminal this punishment, we are actually disrespecting them. We're actually showing them respect by killing them because it's the punishment they deserve. Um, he points to a lot of um, cases in his essay about kind of the mob mentality of people and how uh, a lot of people, when they don't see criminals of such heinous crimes, um, one example I could use here uh, just in Richmond was the Harvey murders in 2006, um, probably one of the most heinous crimes ever to be committed in Richmond. Um, many people were very upset and calling for the deaths of these individuals who committed it. Um, and he points out of how society in some way can break down if we do not have the death penalty to sway this anger that we feel from it. 
Um, he thinks uh, the death penalty is there for what he calls uh, to serve an educative function, that the law must be respected. And he feels that when these things are not respected, we get this sense of anger. And in fact, for him, anger is not a, a bad emotion. It's a good thing. It's actually the sign that shows us that we care and have passion about justice and that we need to sway this anger when some horrible crime happens. The only way to do that, he believes, is by allowing the law to impose the death penalty. That's the only way we can do this. In fact, he even says in some places that um, what if one doesn't get angry with what happens? In fact, he says right here, um, I pointed out on page 314 in the reading, he points that if, if men are not angry when a neighbor suffers at the hands of a criminal, the implication is that their moral faculties have been corrupted, that they are not good citizens. So that means maybe those who maybe will well, forgive people, something like this. Now, maybe you could be angry and still forgive. That's another question. But if you are not to get angry at a certain um, action, does that mean you're not a good citizen? According to Walter Burns, that seems to be the case. Anger seems to be this thing that kind of is like a feeling I get that shows a sign that something must be done. And the only thing that can stop the anger we feel from heinous crimes like the Harvey murders, for example, is the death penalty. And he believes in the end. He thinks in or to make it uh, to allow to impose a death penalty would make us respect the law and make it awe-inspiring. And he says here at the end um, on 315, the law must not be understood to be merely statute that we enact or repeal at our will or disobey or disobey at our convenience, especially not the criminal law. Wherever law is regarded as merely statutory, men will soon enough disobey it, and they will learn how to do so without any inconvenience to themselves. The criminal law must possess a dignity far beyond that possessed by mere statutory enactment or utilitarian and self-interested calculations. The most powerful means we have to give it that dignity is to authorize it to impose the ultimate penalty. The criminal law must be made awful, by which I mean awe-inspiring or commanding profound respect or reverential fear. It must remind us of the moral order by which alone we can live as human beings, and in our day, the only punishment that can do this is capital punishment. That is Walter Burns um, making the moral case for uh, capital punishment. Um, and I just find very interesting how anger is a typical emotion in, in morals and ethics um, that we generally throw out as not being a um, something, you know, most things I do in anger, a lot of times I, I, I regret later. But in this case, Walter Burns thinks this is a, the sign that shows us that something has to be done. Um, I think that's very interesting on his point. I'm not here to criticize him on it. I just um, think that we should point that out. Okay, so now Steve Nathanson, is actually, his article is attacking Burns. Um, he is refer he references him a few times. And the first thing that Nathanson wants to point out, he goes, uh, anger must be limited. Okay, he goes, it's understandable. When people, we, we understand when a horrible act like the Harvey murders that occurs that we get angry, that it upsets us. Um, that is totally normal. But that anger must be limited. And he claims that it does not give us a license to kill. He says, though we may feel angry enough, to kill someone does not imply that doing so would be morally legitimate. I mean, I kind of see that point there. Uh, that's on 317. And he says, so one can uh, sympathize and agree with much of Burns' message, but that message does nothing to support the appropriateness of using death as punishment. To favor severe but lesser punishment in no way to, um, in no way to express, excuse me, is in no way to express indifference or callousness towards the deaths of the murder victims. The anger and grief that we feel about these deaths does not give us a license to kill. And so he's now pointing to this point of just because, you know, I'm angry but not angry enough to want to kill someone, does not mean I don't care about what happened. Um, it, uh, not at all. Um, in fact, he even goes on to say something else is, um, you know, Burns makes a whole big deal about people who respect the moral order and want the death penalty um, and want to respect and make the law awe-inspiring. Um, Nathanson doesn't just seem to get that point. Um, he seems to point out that people who are more critical of the law, who want to um, maybe limit the powers of the law to protect people, might have um, more... Um, more interest and the more order than someone who just respects it for no good reason. Um, it makes me think of like um, uh, Plato in, in the Plato's dialogue to Crito, where Socrates is accepting the law because he's just been a citizen there. And um, his students around him are, are completely confused of why would you accept a law that is unjust? And he says he has to. And I think I've always kind of related with the students there. Like, if it's unjust, why follow it just because it's the law? Um, and here on 318, um, Nathanson says, surely Burns is correct in his view that the nature and content of the law is a serious matter, but it's doubtful that we need to kill people in order to convey that message. Moreover, by revering the law when it does not deserve reverence, we help to perpetuate injustice. A critical and sober view of the law may do more to affirm the moral order than an attitude of awe and exaggerated respect. The critic who sees the flaws of the legal system and wants to limit his powers may be as committed to the moral order as Burns and may indeed have a better way to make the legal system conform to the moral order. Okay. So, now up to this point, all Nathan has done is kind of throw dirt on the, the point Burns was trying to make. 
um, he is not giving a positive argument yet of, well, what should we do? And well, Nathan believes that obviously we should return, we should have only life imprisonment. It doesn't mean, you know, uh, uh, he still believes in severe punishment, but not death. So he says life imprisonment is what we should use. And he thinks that this, his argument is, is that it will symbolize something about human dignity. He actually makes two points um, in the essay. He says, first of all, it will symbolize that criminals still have rights. And in fact, they do. Okay? This is something that we in, our, in the United States do believe in, that even when you're a criminal, you have rights. Now, you lose some rights, okay? perhaps the right to be left alone, he points out. Um, you are forced into having to come to court, um, having to have some sentence if it happens, but you do not lose all your rights. And he thinks you will, should not lose your right to life. He even points out the idea of cruel and unusual punishment. You know, we, we already understand that we just can't do anything to a criminal, even if they're horrible. We understand that point. So why wouldn't we want to extend that to life? Okay, that they still deserve life, even though they're horrible. Doesn't mean they get out, doesn't mean they're allowed to be free, but if they if we can keep them in prison and keep them safe from others, why would we kill them? Why not respect their rights, even as a criminal? And then the second point he wants to look at is he says um, it would symbolize um, the respect we have just for human life, human dignity, okay? The, uh, the um, kind of symbolization that human life is worth something no matter what, that it symbolizes that it deserves to be respected even in the worst people. And, you know, he kind of thinks this way. is like, you know, what good way to show that, you know, a murder is wrong for taking someone's life because all life should be respected. What is the best way to show that? Taking life? Hmm, that, that sounds ridiculous that Nathan said. The best way to show that we should respect all life is to respect all life. And even though this criminal has done something horrible like not respect life, what is the best way to show that we do not believe in that? He says the best way is to give them life imprisonment and keep them alive. Show that even in the worst people, we still think life is important. So that's what it will symbolize. Respect for human life and respect for the criminal's rights. Um, that is his symbolic argument. And in the end, um, I think one major critique that gets thrown at, at Nathanson that we need to bring up before we finish is the idea of moral monsters. Um, he says, you know, you know, well, okay, we, we, like, we can see that, that, all right, maybe in most cases the death penalty isn't just, but what about moral monsters? What about Stalin or Hitler or, um, you know, uh, someone awful like that? Political leaders who, you know, have committed genocide. Um, and he has two points he wants to make. Um, and he kind of shows his split with the other abolitionists of the death penalty. Um, his first point is that to bring up ideas of like political leaders that are moral monsters um, is actually not what he's been talking about. He says that confuses the issue because we were talking about the death penalty for normal citizens. The majority of us are not political leaders, are any capable of, you know, by speaking, you know, one sentence that I could bring down an entire nation. We aren't people like that. So he says to throw the, these moral monsters in there, you're kind of convoluting the point, which the entire time we're talking about the death penalty for citizens. Um, now, that's actually not Nathan's point. He says that's the point of some other abolitionists. His point is, he goes, but even if he thinks, you know, maybe there are moral monsters and maybe there are sometimes conditions for political leaders over um, citizens, he says still, if we can be sure someone like Hitler or Stalin would be, you know, would not harm anyone else and could be kept away from committing any more acts of murder or something horrible like that, then he believes that we should even keep someone like a Hitler or a Stalin alive as long as we can protect them from other people. Um, and so Nathanson sells out completely. There is never an argument that can be made for the death penalty. Um, though some of his other abolitionists may disagree with him on that, um, Burns for sure disagrees with him. So um, those are the two arguments we looked at in a nutshell, right? Um, if you have any questions, please let me know, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.